I on? Okay. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati. My name is Trish Hart, and I am your worship leader this morning. My pronouns are she, her. I joined the UU faith in my early 20s, attending the First Unitarian Church in Columbus, Ohio. After moving to Cincinnati at age 29, I continued my faith at St. John's UU Church. In 2016, Janet Phillips and I were married, and we joined this community this past December. We've been singing in the choir and slowly getting to know folks. Located on the ancestral lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Miamia and Shawnee people, our urban community welcomes all with love, supports learning and spiritual growth, serves our wider community, and works for justice, equity, and inclusion. We are glad you are here with us this morning, whether in person or virtually. During the service, you may hear mention of programs or other items of interest. It may raise questions for you. If you would like to learn more about these events, our community, or ask questions about our community and our faith, please contact us at membercare at firstuu.com. Today I am reading the words of Billy Porter. Billy Porter is a queer black actor, writer, and human rights activist. We have to empower ourselves especially within the LGBT and queer people. Up until recently, the conversation has been about acceptance and tolerance towards LGBTQI people, and I have a hard time with that because that puts my validation as a human being on this planet in someone else's hands. I don't care about your acceptance or tolerance. What I demand is your respect for my humanity as I respect every single person on this planet. This is the new conversation. As we light our chalice today, let us think deeply about what Billy Porter has said. I don't care about your acceptance or your tolerance. What I demand is your respect for my humanity as I respect every single person on this planet. This is the new conversation. If that makes some of us as Unitarian Universalists uncomfortable, that is good, because living into our faith requires us to often be uncomfortable as we struggle through our own prejudices. As Susan Frederick Gray, our UUA president, frequently says, this is no time for a casual faith. This is for we must be shaken from our comfort in order to understand what is at stake. And now we will sing the vision song followed by greeting your neighbors.
When Aiden Became a Brother by Kyle Lukoff, illustrated by Kehlani Juanita. When Aiden was born, everyone thought he was a girl. His parents gave him a pretty name. His room looked like a girl's room, and he wore clothes that other girls liked wearing. But as Aiden got bigger, he hated the sound of his name. He felt like his room belonged to someone else, and he always ripped or stained his clothes accidentally on purpose. Everyone thought he was just a different kind of girl. Some girls had rooms full of science experiments and bug collections. Lots of girls didn't wear dresses. But Aiden didn't feel like any kind of girl. He was really another kind of boy. It was hard to tell his parents boy. It was hard to tell his parents what he knew about himself. But it was even harder not to. It took everyone some time to adjust, and they learned a lot from other families with transgender kids like him. Aiden explored different ways of being a boy. He tried out lots of names until one stuck. They changed his bedroom into a place where he belonged. He also took much better care of his new clothes. Then, one day, mom and dad had something to tell him. I'm going to have a baby, mom announced. A baby, Aiden said. Does that mean I get to be the big brother? <laughs> of course, said dad, ruffling his hair. Aiden thought that being a big brother was an important job for a boy like him. He wanted to make sure this baby would feel understood right away. The baby needed clothes, so Aiden and his mom went shopping. There are so many choices. Would the baby like seahorses or penguins better? Are you having a boy or a girl? asked a lady. Aiden didn't like it when people asked if he was a boy or a girl, and he hoped the baby couldn't hear yet. He was glad when mom just smiled and said, I'm having a baby. The baby's room needed to be painted, so Aiden and his dad went to the hardware store. Dad chose a gallon of sky blue paint and Aiden added a puffy cloud white. Are you excited for your new brother or sister? Asked the paint guy. I'm excited to be a big brother, Aiden said. The paint guy looked confused. Aiden could tell that he wanted to ask a different question and was glad to have his dad there. The rollers were fun to paint with. The room feels just like being outside, Aiden exclaimed. He had always felt trapped in his bedroom before they fixed it. But his new sibling wouldn't have to feel that way. You're right, said Dad. Let's make some shapes in the clouds. Every baby needs a name. Aiden loved getting to choose his own but he remembered that it had been hard for his parents to let go of the name they gave him. He looked for names that could fit this new person, no matter who they grew up to be. Moss, leaf, cloud, rain, river. Babies need someone to read to them, so Aiden practiced and practiced and practiced. Dad wanted to teach Aiden how to change diapers. Um, maybe later, said Aiden. He decided that picking flowers for his mom was more important. Two weeks before the baby's due date, 
Aiden started to worry. Maybe he should have picked different clothes. The blue walls might be too bright. He wished he could ask the baby which name they liked best. Mom came to tuck him in. Are you feeling okay, sweetie? She asked. Aiden put his hands over where he thought the baby's ears would be. Do you think the baby will be happy with everything? He whispered. I don't want them to feel like I did when I was little. But what if I get everything wrong? What if I don't know how to be a good big brother? Mom hugged him tight. When you were born, we didn't know you were going to be our son. We made some mistakes, but you helped us fix them. And you taught us how important it is to love someone for exactly who they are. This baby is so lucky to have you, and so are we. The next morning, Aiden found the boxes of his old baby pictures. He looked so different back then. It hadn't been easy, but he liked the boy he was growing into. Maybe everything wouldn't be perfect for this baby. Maybe he would have to fix mistakes he didn't even know he was making. And maybe that was okay. Aiden knew how to love someone, and that was the most important part of being a big brother. Today's story explored themes of gender identity and gender expression. Gender expression can be really fun when we give people the space to explore what feels good to them. There are so many different ways to show off our gender and ourselves. I wonder, what are some ways you are expressing or showing your gender today? I wonder, how might this change on a different day? Tricky. Um, this is the time when we hold the joys and sorrows that are on our hearts. We have stones and water to represent our joys and sorrows. The water represents the love of community. By dropping a stone in water, we do so to seek the softening of our sorrows and the amplification of our joys. All the individual joys and sorrows come together in one bowl of water to be shared and borne by us as a collective community. So at this time, I invite you to come forward up the side aisles and back down the middle to amplify your joy or soften your sorrow.
I would like to add one more stone uh, for those thoughts, love, and memories of people or events that have not been named. Our Share the Plate recipient for the month of July is the Inner Community Justice and Peace Center, or IJPC. The IJPC educates and advocates for peace, challenges unjust local, national, and global systems, and promotes the creation of a nonviolent society. They focus on educational programming and advocacy campaigns through a lens of nonviolence. Giving to First Church is easy. You can text the word GIVE to 513-717-7373. If you have access to our Breeze member system, you may click Give Now, or you can give online at firstuu.com. You can also write a check to First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati and mail it to 536 Linton Street, Cincinnati, Ohio 45219. If you are giving to IJPC, our Share the Plate recipient, please write IJPC in the memo line of your check. If this is your first time with us, please let the virtual plate pass you by. Your presence is gift enough to our church. The beautiful flowers today are in honor of Doug and Patricia Rohr. We're celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Wow. Thank you, Jero. The Reverend Christy Lunsford is a trans man who goes by they and them pronouns. Reverend Lunsford is the pastor of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Gainesville, Florida. You may recognize this church because it is the new home church for our dear friends and former members, Susan and Tim Christie. This sermon was delivered this past June as part of their Pride Month observance. 
but Reverend Lunsford's message is still very relevant today as we face the potential of new discriminatory laws against the LGBTQI plus community in the wake of the Supreme Court decision against the rights of those seeking abortions. The reading this morning is from the Reverend Chris Rothbauer. The first time I was told I was too queer to be a congregation's minister, they asked, what will the neighbors think? As if that were the most natural question in the world. It was then that I understood how grace works. It's costly. It requires us to be uncomfortable, to get outside ourselves, to go all in. I decided I didn't want a wishy-washy faith, one that uses me to signal virtue. We're so enlightened. We support same-sex marriage as if it's a contest to see who can hold these most correct positions and not my life they're talking about. Were there trans women? Were they there when trans women were murdered in Montgomery? Or when a queer couple was denied the right to adopt children? Or when Congress failed yet again to pass an Employment Non-Discrimination Act that would keep people like me from being fired just for who we are. Or when a teenager despondent when their parents told them to get the hell out of their house took an overdose of their antidepressants. I don't want a faith that cares more about what conservative neighbors, who would never join us anyway, think more than caring about affirming my humanity, who understand that throwing your lot in with marginalized people requires more than talking about your friendship with a lesbian couple down the street. I don't want a faith that wordsmiths my truth, that asks why is it necessary to use the words that best describe my experience as a queer person. I don't need help finding alternative words that might go better with strangers. I need my siblings in faith to notice their discomfort in hearing about my experiences and use it as a catalyst to action rather than as a way to submit, cement their own comfort. I want a faith that doesn't consider me a queer minister, but rather does its damnedest to live into our professed values. I want a faith that centers my voice and others like me when necessary, that doesn't think that decades of marginalization can be erased with a few good deeds. I don't want a faith that claims to be universalist, but constantly judges some of us for the sin of not conforming to ideas of who we should be. Instead, I want to build this faith. I'll do it with my own two hands if I have to. If I pick up some friends along the way, maybe we might be able to build something spectacular together. These words by my dear friend, longtime friend and colleague, Reverend Chris Rothbauer, brings all kinds of feelings and thoughts to my mind. The first is, hell yes, that's exactly what I want to. I don't want a casual faith that checks boxes. I want an active faith that is capable of living into our values. 
a faith that can understand and embrace that gender expression and sexual orientation are two separate things, but they have one thing in common, body autonomy. Where a person can express their gender outwardly without question or condemnation, or where a person can be sexually attracted to any gender expression regardless of the checkbox or social marker. But there's this third place for me. You see, there are some freedoms that cross over randomly drawn social lines. Self-expression and body autonomy rights and freedoms are women's rights, adoption rights, abortion rights, racial equality rights, disability rights, and so, so much more. And all of these, they are all LGBTQ rights. And none of us are free until all of us are free. All of these things are very much on my mind as I prepare to go to the UUA General Assembly. For those of you who don't know what that is or have never been, General Assembly, which is also commonly known as GA, is where we UUs do the work of the larger association, where this congregation and every congregation in the association gets a vote or multiple votes on how we will be with each other and in the world. In pre-COVID times, there would have been four or 5,000 UUs gathered in person. That's a lot. Now that we're hybrid, it's a harder thing to know exactly how many people are in the room. But at the same time, it's an accessibility issue that makes it possible for all of our congregations to have a voice, not just the ones that can afford to go to General Assembly. And let me tell you, the experience of being together in thousands of UUs can fill one's soul. It's a beautiful thing. And for those of us with historically marginalized identities, it can be an extremely hurtful place. Now, I know that probably sounds like I misspoke, but it's true. The UU community is simply a micro version of the greater world. And yet we get lulled into thinking that that UU bubble will hold us all. And we think it will hold everyone well. How many of you have ever been in a room where your presence seemed to be overlooked or you felt invisible? Because I know I have. I think most of us have at one time or another in our lives, even the members of the dominant culture and gender presentation and the ruling class. At some point, you felt left out in the room. But I want to take that to the next level. Can you imagine sitting in a space where your presence is openly asked for? Where you're not just invited, where you're expected to be there. One might think that feels good. But when you're there, your actual existence comes up for debate and discussion. And there will be a vote to determine the amount of inclusion and the amount of welcome that will be extended. Are you uncomfortable yet? 
uncomfortable with our faith? Please don't hear that this is my pain. You see, I'm the acceptable one. I'm the trans minister who presents male, who is Caucasian, overly educated and financially stable, whose family didn't abandon me when I came out, each time I came out. So hear me when I say, I'm the acceptable one. Let it sink in. I can walk into a room, raise my voice, and get people's attention without making them uncomfortable. But you see, each of you in this room and online, you should be uncomfortable. It is not unknown to you that in recent years, and even more so in recent months, in days, just last night, we have seen an uptick in hate crimes and violence. Even in Pride Month, Pride celebrations are being disrupted. We're seeing a all-for-one and one-for-one me attitude. The inherent worth and dignity has lost connection to the web of all existence. So how do we reconnect? How do we mend that the needs of the one and the needs of the community? We begin with events like pride. Our current American culture often teaches and preaches, however, about oppression. And in the current face of push and push for anti-trans and don't say gay bills, even though those things are there, there's a deeper, subtler cultural indoctrination that encourages what we call internalized oppression. There are these small messages around us every day in all forms, in our idioms, in media, in the news, in commerce, TV and movies, songs, photographs, and art. These subtle cues that inform our personal internal messaging. Messages that tell us what's acceptable and how to be. And those messages form us. Internally, they create this space for shame and denial, self-hatred and fear. And these lead to harmful situations where hate and fear can lead to self-harm, self-denial, and sometimes death. But messages of pride encourage us to feel our feelings. It allows us space to be angry, to be strong, and to be joyful. There are the messages about how we might transform self-hatred into pride, because pride is a fundamental act of resistance. Nothing makes that little voice out there that's telling us it's bad more angry and go away faster than saying, this is exactly who I am and I am proud of it and there's nothing you can say. That's the act of resistance when you celebrate. Although it's important and wonderful to have allies recognize Pride Month, it's most important that the LGBTQ community make space and have space that functions the way we want it to, the way we build it. And that space allows room for both witness 
and pride. It's a place where we can witness history, both personally and collectively. It's a place where we can grieve and rage. And it's a place where we can be joyful, knowing we are seen in our fullness and loved for our fullness. And it's most important that we not let our ability to witness and to be proud become conflated with one another. Because that's what true liberation looks like, the ability to hold the complexity of both. So how might we begin? I often lean on my colleagues who write these beautiful prose and poems that make it so I don't have to craft all the words. So today I share with you my colleague, Reverend Otto O'Connor, and his beautifully crafted words to help us begin the naming and the remembering. On a holy night in 1969, in an inn, also known as a bar, called the Stonewall Inn, a basement which had no running water and no safe fire exits, queer people of many colors and kinds danced together, for it was the only place where they were allowed to dance, at least permitted to, by the mafia who ran the inn. In those days, it was common for the police to frequent this inn, not to join in the dance, the underground celebration, but to send the dancers home and make arrests. When they would arrive, the lights would go on, the people would be lined up, and then all those in drag all those who were trans, and those without proper identification, they were arrested and taken into custody. But on this holy night, that early morning of June 28th, the people said, not tonight. As they called for them to line up, the trans women refused to go. As the police began to beat and arrest them, and as people spilled out of the bar onto the street, Christopher Street, a crowd grew to watch. And then, as trans women, lesbians, and gay men were getting arrested, a yell came from the crowd. Gay power! And as a trans woman was shoved, she shoved back and the crowd began to throw bottles at the wagon, and suddenly it erupted. For once, the people didn't line up. For once, the people said, no more, we've had enough. It was almost as if that night, being pulled out of the darkness of the underground in Stonewall Inn, one too many times, they said, I'm ready to be seen. On this holy night, when the power of the oppressed rippled through the streets of New York, where queer people said no more, our world would never be the same. Fifty years ago, it was illegal to be gay, to be trans, to dance, to love, and to celebrate. And now, only 50 years later, here we are celebrating in church. Gay and straight together? Queer and straight together? Trans and cis together? All in this together. And so as we hear these stories of life and love and defiance and celebration, let us also remember to pay tribute to our movement ancestors, many of them trans women of color who led the first rebellion that night. 
You see, pride is a celebration of that anniversary. The anniversary of the riot at Stonewall Inn in New York City. A holy night. So happy pride. Welcome to this joyful celebration. Bring your whole selves. Your gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer selves. Your drag queen, butch and femme, cross-dressing, nail-painting, tutu-wearing selves. Your gender-queer, gender-fluid, asexual, pansexual, quilt-bag selves, and all other identities that are and will be. And let's have a celebration. Because joy is a rebellion, too. It's important, my friends, that we not let our ability to witness and to be proud become conflated with one another. Until we have built a community that can hold both, and some of us are building that community with our own two hands, and we found some friends along the way, and there's still room for you to join us. We are building a community of resilience. We are demanding respect for our humanity. LGBTQ pride is a rebellion of joy and love. Amen. inclusion that really spoke to me and I appreciate that sermon um, we are now going to sing by Jamie Stone there is more love somewhere Jamie Stone had to do a quick look up and uh, uh, banjo player from Canada and uh, wrote a lot of folk songs so hopefully you guys know this one if not it's pretty simple and we can all learn it together
And now our closing words, only begun by William G. Sinkford. Spirit of life and love, God of all nations, there is so much work to do. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Help us hold fast to our vision of what can be. May we see the hope in our history and find the courage and the voice to work for that constant rebirth of freedom and justice. That is our dream. And so we extinguish our chalice by repeating the following words printed on the screen. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of community. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.